All right, welcome to the book club interview. My name is Scott Hollister, your host. This is where we read a book a week and then interview the author on topics such as business, real estate, and life. Today, we read The Go-Giver by Bob Berg, and he wrote a best-selling business parable, The Go-Giver, and then the follow-up, The Go-Giver Leader. Bob Berg and John David Mann challenged the conventional wisdom about success. Now they're back with a new and equally compelling story about the power of genuine influence in business and beyond. The Go-Giver Influencer, a story about a most persuasive idea, tackles the paradox of achieving what you want by focusing on the other person's interest. No, not in a way that is self-sacrificial, but rather in such a way that all parties benefit greatly. This results in both immediate and long-term success. Bob Burke speeds all over the world on topics related to the go-giver, as well as what he calls ultimate influence. While his total book sales number well over a million copies, his and man's original book has itself sold over 700,000 copies and has spurred an international movement. In their new book, however, The Go Giver Influencer might just be their most important book of all. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Bob. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for coming out. Honored to be part of your book club. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Uh, Like I said before, uh, I've uh, been reading books for a while as a teacher for four years, and when I read your book a couple weeks ago, uh, it, it instantly went into my top 10 favorite books of all time, so uh, phenomenal job writing the book, so thank you. Thank you. My absolute pleasure. Thank you. And John David Mann, my co-author, you know, he's really the lead writer and storyteller, so he's uh, I'm much more of a how-to guy. I'm step one, step two, step three. John has a way of putting uh, magic to uh, to that, and really... Uh, the the credit is is really due him. Great, great. Yeah, it takes a team to to accomplish great goals, and you guys have an awesome yeah. team there. So uh, let's run right into it. So so what's the premise of the book itself? So the premise is that shifting your focus, and this is really the key, shifting your focus from getting to giving. And when we say giving in this context, we simply mean constantly and consistently providing value to others and that and understanding that doing this is not only a, a nice way a pleasant way of conducting business but the most financially profitable way as well not not for some you know way out there woo woo kind of esoteric reasons mm-hmm. but really just having an understanding of human nature that no one's going to buy from you because you have a quota to meet or because you need the money or because you're a really nice person who who believes in your product they're going to buy from you or from me or for from anyone uh, because they believe they'll be better off by doing so than by not doing so, which is the only reason they they should buy. And what that does, the beauty of that as it relates to the free market, is that it it ensures that the salesperson or the entrepreneur, what have you, is going to place their interests first, is always going to be focused on on what's going to be of value to them. Great. Uh, can you please give us a quick review of the five laws you and John share in the book? Sure. The laws themselves are the laws of value, compensation, influence, authenticity, and receptivity. The first one, the law of value, tells us that the the, the, the real key here is to provide such an enormous, wonderful, over-the-top customer experience that this person feels as though they receive lots more in value than what they paid. While, of course, you as the entrepreneur or salesperson also made a very, very healthy profit. So that's really the key. And it's understanding that in today's world where most products and services are pretty much pretty equal. You know, I mean, the, the technology is, is leveled off the playing field. And if a, if a potential customer cannot see any significant difference between any two or more products, or service, you know, between any two or more vendors regarding the product, they're always going to go with the the lowest price. Uh, and we would say that unless your last name is Walmart, uh, trying to make low price your unique selling proposition is not a fun way to do business. It's not a healthy way to do business, and it's certainly not a sustainable way to do business. So, uh, so what you want to do is rather than trying to sell on low price, in which you're looked at as a commodity sell on high value in which you now are now a resource great so let's go back to value though 
How does a person add value to others without costing too much money, especially in such a competitive economic environment? Sure. So think about value and the difference between price and value, because price is a dollar amount. It's a dollar figure. It's finite. It simply is what it is. It's the price of a thing. Value, on the other hand, is the relative worth or desirability of a thing to the end user or beholder. In other words, what is it about this thing, this product, service, concept, idea that brings so much value or worth with it that someone will willingly exchange their, their money for it? Okay, so one's the price. The other is what this person feels they are receiving. Now, not just from the intrinsic value of that product or service, but the entire customer experience. So this is what we add. This is what we're talking about when we say add more value to it. How? Well, you become that additional value, okay? So how do you do that? Well, there are probably hundreds of ways to communicate that additional value, but they, they tend to come down to five what we call elements of value. And they are excellence, consistency, attention, empathy, and appreciation. And to the degree that you and everyone on your team is able to communicate those elements, one or two, or hopefully all five of them, at every touch point, Scott, from when you first meet that person or when that person first calls on the phone or comes into the office or receives a, so, uh, to the, the relationship being built, to the sales process, to the referrals afterwards and the sustainability, to the degree that, that, that they feel and that you're able to communicate those five elements of value, that's the degree that you take price and your competition out of the equation. Great. Now, was the one piece of advice you received before you even knew anything about what being a go-giver entailed, what, that was a difference maker for you? Oh sure, and I, I glad, and that has a lot to do with value. And so let me go through that, and then I'll, then I'll even go back to the other the other four laws if you want, um, because I, I remember that it was a couple of years after I, I got into sales, and I was doing pretty well. I had studied sales, I understood it. Um, I well, I, I was also though a lot like Joe in the story. I had a lot of potential, but it was untapped. And there was something holding me back. And of course, as you can imagine, it was myself. That's usually what it is. And I remember coming back from an appointment one day. It was a non-selling appointment. It wasn't non-selling by choice. It was that I didn't do what was necessary in terms of, of creating value uh, for the customer. So I, I came back into the office and uh, I wasn't very happy and my face must have betrayed my lack of happiness. And one of the, the older guys there, I, he, in fact, he was just about to retire, and he wasn't even in sales. I think he was in the engineering department or something. But uh, I remember seeing him in the halls every so often. Nice guy, but I didn't know him very well. But uh, he looked at me and he said, Berg, can I give you some advice? And I said, yeah, sure, please. And he said, if you want to make a lot of money in business, actually he said, if you want to make a lot of money in sales, he said, don't have making money as your target. The target, he said, is serving others. Now, when you hit the target, he continued, you'll get a reward. And that reward will come in the form of money. And you can do with that money whatever you choose. But never forget, he said, the money is simply the reward for hitting the target. It's not the target itself. The target is serving others. And that was really an epiphany for me because what it said was, you know, it isn't about me. In fact, it isn't even about the product or service. It's about what that other person the, the benefits or the advantages they will derive as a result of utilizing that product or service. And so when, they, when the focus is on the other person and not on ourselves, we actually become a lot more profitable, you know, for the, for the very reason we talked about earlier, that that's what they're looking for. They're not interested in our issues. They're interested in, in theirs, which they, which they should be. So that's really, and of course, that, that's what the law of value is all about, what he talked about, and that is focusing on the other. So the second law, the law of compensation, says that your income is determined by how many people you serve and how well you serve them. So where law number one, the focus is on providing exceptional value to the other person, law number two says that your income is derived by, by how many, in other words, the number of people whose lives you're able to impact with that exceptional value. Uh, one of the mentors in the story, the, uh, the CEO, Nicole Martin, she told Joe that law number one, as important as it is, 
that's the foundational principle, but that just represents your potential income. It's not enough typically to serve just one person. Uh, law number two, which talks about the money with which you'll be rewarded, that has to do with reach, right? You've got to be able to reach, and that's why a referral business is so helpful, because referred prospects, it's easier to set the appointment, you go in on borrowed interest, uh, borrowed influence, you, uh, it's easier to complete the transaction because of borrowed trust or vicarious experience. And typically, uh, people you've been referred to, they're much more likely to refer you because they see that as being the way you do business. That's how you, they, they met you. So, um, so yes, it's, it's important, yes, to, to serve people with excellence, but it's also important to serve a lot of people with excellence. <laughs> well said. Law number, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> law number three is the law of influence. And, and this one says that your influence is determined by how abundantly you place other people's interests first. Now, I realize this can sound counterintuitive, uh, perhaps counterproductive, perhaps even downright Pollyanna-ish, right? And yet, you think about the greatest leaders, top influencers, highest producing salespeople, this is how they run their lives and conduct their businesses. They're always looking for ways to bring value to others. Their focus is placing that other person's interest first. When we say that, however, we certainly don't mean you should be a doormat or you should be a martyr or you should be self-sacrificial. That's not what this is about at all. It is understanding that all things being equal, people will do business with and refer business to those people they know, like, and trust, and that there's no faster, more powerful, or more effective way to elicit those feelings toward you from others than by genuinely and authentically moving from what we call an I focus or me focus to an other focus. Looking for ways to, as uh, Sam, one of the mentors in the story, advised Joe, make your win all about the other person's win. Law number four is the law of authenticity, and this simply says the most valuable gift you have to offer is yourself. And one of the mentors at that point, uh, Deborah Davenport, explained or shared something she learned that was very helpful to her, and that is that all the skills in the world, the uh, sales skills, technical skills, people skills, as important as they are, and indeed they are all very, very important, uh, they're also all for naught if you don't come at it from your true authentic core. Now, when you do, when you, as we like to say, show up as yourself day after day, week after week, month after month, people feel very comfortable with you. People feel safe with you. They feel good about you. They know you. They like you. They love you. They trust you. Uh, they most likely want to do business with you, be a part of your life. These are the kind of people who, whether or not you end up doing business with them because they may not have a need or, or a want for your product or service, these people will become your personal walking ambassadors. And they know that they can do this because they know you always are going to show up as yourself. You know, they know you're always going to represent who you are by your way of being. I think sometimes people confuse authenticity with not having a need to continue to grow or improve. You know, it's almost like, well, I, you know, this is just the way I am. And, you know, yeah. and, and that's not what it is at all. We, it's like the person who says, well, I have anger issues and I yell at people a lot. And if I were to act any differently, that wouldn't be authentic. And <laughs> that, of course, is malarkey. Right? That's, mm -hmm. that's baloney. It simply means that person has an authentic problem and he needs to authentically work on it in order to become a higher, more effective authentic version of, of himself. So we never want to stop learning. We don't we don't utilize we don't use the concept of authenticity to stay where we're at. Instead we utilize it in order to step into a higher and always growing authentic self. Uh, and then the last one, Scott, is um, uh, the law of receptivity. And this one simply says the key to effective giving is to stay open to receiving. And this means nothing more than that we, as human beings, we, we both breathe out and we breathe in. It's not one or the other. We breathe out carbon dioxide, we breathe in oxygen. We breathe out, which is giving, we breathe in, which is receiving. We get so many messages from the world around us in, in, in regards to abundance and prosperity. And I won't say they're mixed messages because there's nothing mixed about them. We get horrible, terrible negative messages about prosperity. And and that can mess with a person's head and it can keep a person 
from being able to receive because if it's been drummed into one's head even unconsciously that people who make a lot of money are evil or horrible or have done things to others well you know we're not going to let ourselves receive if we consider ourselves to be a good person so we've got to continue always working on an abundance mindset that says hey if you're providing value to the marketplace if you're bringing value to someone you've earned the right not the entitlement but the right to receive we do need to be able to do so we need to be able to accept that uh, and you know so it's not a matter of are you a giver or a receiver no you're a giver and a receiver but you realize that the focus needs to be on the giving that's how life happens right we 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 uh, sow and then we reap um, and and that's important and this is why also we say that money is simply an echo of value okay the value must come first that's why the focus has got to be on the value the value comes first the money you receive is simply a very natural and very direct result of the value you've provided. Now, when you first got that advice, did you start, you know, creating these values to live by or, you know, how long did it take to for that to sink in and start applying? Well, you know, I grew up with parents who just are great people and set a wonderful example in terms of how to live a good life and you know and be kind and, and look to provide value and, and so forth I think as I got older and I got into business I lost my way a little bit you get around people that kind of influence you in a way that's maybe not the most powerful and you allow that to happen and so forth and then after a while hopefully you see that's not a really good way of doing things and that it's not a comfortable way and it's not a productive way and uh, you know, and then when that person came around who kind of got my head on straight about what selling was, that made a big difference. And I, I kind of went back to my roots. You know, I went back to who I'm really about. And uh, so, you know, I got got very lucky in that regard. Yeah, back to your authenticity. I love that. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Now, during that phase, was was that a hard? You know, you said you got away from your core, so it sounded like your parents instilled some great, you know, success and habits and being a kind person. Um, did you get away from that? And and did your, you know, forgive me for being too personal, that, okay. but we're talking about a business book and family life, and, and did mm -hmm. that pull from other areas um, as a, a well balanced person? Well, I think it does because I think, it, uh, you know, I think there's a, a harmony in how we are and it's very difficult to be one way at the office and another way at home or another way with friends or another way. You know, you can try that, but it, it doesn't work out very well. It's hard to, you know, the sense of incongruency will come back to, you know, to get you eventually. Um, you know, I think people who are uh, kind are kind at the office and they're kind at home. You know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I think if they're, they're honest at the office, they're honest at home. You know, it's, you yeah. know what I'm saying? And I've seen very few people who can pull off that kind of, uh, discrepancy. In fact, I don't, I don't know anyone who, who can. Yeah. Okay. Now it sounded like you had a great mentor. You got some great advice along the way. So let's talk about mentorship. Uh, first, what's the best way to find a mentor? Perhaps most importantly, what should an up and comer not do when trying to find <laughs> one? Well, that's a good, that's a great question uh, because, you know, mentorship is great. I mean, if you can find a mentor, my goodness, they, they can help cut your learning curve time by years. They can instill you with confidence and encouragement and guidance and all that's wonderful. I think a lot of times you, when you see people going about trying to find a mentor in a way that, you know, that I believe is, is counterproductive, they will, they'll seek out someone who they admire and respect that, that part's good, but they'll just kind of say, Hey, would you be my mentor? <laughs> and, uh, you know, first of all, someone who you're wanting to be your mentor, probably there's lots of other people who'd like them to be their mentor. And so how you ask is probably going to have a lot, you know, go, go a, a certain ways toward toward that happening. Uh, when you just say, hey, will you be my mentor? It's sort of like saying to a person, hey, will you share your 40 years of knowledge and wisdom with me, even though you don't really know me from a hole in the wall, right? Mm -hmm. So I think what we need to do is approach it a, a little bit differently. Now, you can really approach almost anyone and, you know, within reason and and say to that person, uh, you know, something like I'm just starting out in business or I'm just beginning to so-and-so, I really admire your work. Uh, I'd like to ask you, and if you just simply don't have the time, absolutely, I'll, I'll understand. May I ask you one or two very specific questions? Boom. 
And when you do that, you first respected the process. You don't come across as entitled or as though they owe you something, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and most people for, you know, if you say one or two specific questions, not all, but most people will say, sure, absolutely, go right ahead. And so, you know, you now, of course, make sure you do a thorough job of um, checking them out on the internet, which, you know, there's no excuse these days not to do that. When I was a kid, you went to the library to check out a person. You hoped you could find information. Now you can pretty much, you know, find information. So you definitely don't want to ask him or her something that you easily could have discovered through doing your research. Okay. But, um, but so you ask one or two specific questions and they answer, don't take up a lot of their time. Uh, thank them profusely, let them know that you, you look forward to applying their, their wisdom and that you'll get back to them. You'll circle back around and let them know how things are going. Now that day I would write a handwritten personalized note of thanks. I'd put it inside a number 10 envelope, hand addressed, hand stamped. Um, and just to say, you know, thank you so much again for, for sharing your time with me. I know how very busy you are. Please know I appreciate it. Just a short, you know, note. I would also um, make a small, and it just doesn't have to be big, just a small donation to their, their favorite charity in their name, which, again, you can find out through just looking on their website or, or uh, on an, an Internet article or, or something. And um, do it, you know, in the, I don't care if it's $25, but in their name, they'll be notified of it and you're not doing it to kiss up or anything, but just again, so that they know you respect the process. You know what I'm saying? And now, you know, so anything like that, or if they're a collector of old books, you know, books on ancient Roman, uh, military strategy, find one of those books somewhere, send it to them or, you know, uh, but then, you know, eventually you'll connect back around with them just to let them know how things are going. Maybe ask another question if they don't mind and so forth. And over time, if a mentor protege relationship is supposed to develop, it will. If not, it won't. You can't force these things. Um, and it may be that this person was there for one or two questions and somebody else will be there for another one or two questions and somebody else for another one or two. And then you'll hit someone who, you know, for a year or two, you have a mentor protege type of relationship. You just don't know. But but that's pretty much, you know, if you if you follow those guidelines, you're much more likely to be able to connect with someone in that way. Well, that's a go giving way. I see the similarities. You know, you're, you're, <laughs> you're focused on the, the the relationship building on the value. You're appreciating that right, mentor instead right. of just asking for something and focus on yourself. Um, right. And that's how I used to, you know, be able to connect with mentors even when they were for a short time. But it, it was amazing. You know, when I look back on it in my career, both in sales and then in speaking, um, you know, I'd make these connections fairly quickly and fairly solidly, but it was always because on my mind, I'm thinking, what can I do to somehow, some way bring value to them? Great. Uh, that's great advice. So how does a protege right. then provide value to his or her mentor? I mean, certainly they're not in the position to give value to them. Right. Well, not, not the same type of value. You know, mm -hmm. not in terms of connections or in terms of, but you, you just never know. First, I mean, again, it could, you know, you could always... Uh, you know, send a, a um, certificate for dinner, you know, or something for, for two or, or a gift. And that there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, or, you know, you never know who this for this person might need a certain service. And, uh, or, you know, you've kind of found out that they are looking for it and you make you make sure you find someone for them and then you get back with them and let them know. And would they like you to make the connection? And so, you know, there's all sorts of ways that we can find a way to be of service to someone if we look for it enough. Mm -hmm. Of course, we don't want to force it and we don't want them to feel as though, you know, but uh, but in a natural way, absolutely. Yeah, it's a delicate balance. Yes. You make an interesting point um, that I think we should spend more time on. You said the go-giver philosophy is totally congruent with human nature. Well, that could be looked at in many ways, not all of them positive. So could you explain huh. on that? Yeah, well, people who are successful tend to tend to look for truths, okay? And they don't delude themselves into thinking that what that how they would like the world to be is the way the world is, or how they'd like people to be is how people always are, okay? Now they're always trying to improve on it, but they're basically operating from a sense of truth. And, and let, me, let me explain first in terms of the laws of physical nature, okay? Gravity. Okay, gravity just is. Gravity is not good or bad, but it does exist in our earthly existence. 
uh, it manifests itself as good when it keeps us from floating aimlessly up into space. It manifests itself as bad when we walk off a seven story building. Okay. So I don't care how positive a person is. You cannot, you cannot go against the laws of gravity. I mean, you can accept gravity as a truth. You can deny it, but you can't alter it. Okay. So when let's, so let's say the people who were first trying to invent flight, they were trying to invent a machine that could actually fly. Now they didn't say, Hey, you know what? I'm going to be real positive about this. This gravity thing that holds things down, we're going to forget about that. We're going to just, we'll think positive enough and just act as though that's not an issue and we'll get into a machine and it will fly. That, they didn't do that. Of course not. What they did is they first studied the laws of physics, right? Hmm. The laws of gravity, the laws of aerodynamics, and they built a machine that was able to utilize that as a way to propel itself upward and so it, right, what happened. Okay, same here. We look at human nature, and we know that human nature is human nature. People are going to do things because they believe it's in their best interest to do it. Okay, that's not a bad thing. It sounds like a bad thing. Well, like if somebody says, what about when someone gives a charity? Uh, you know, that's not in their best interest. They're giving money away. No, it's absolutely in their best interest because it's congruent with their values. It's something they feel better about by doing than by not doing. Okay, someone gives to an animal organization, the animals can't say thank you. That's not why you're doing it. You're doing it because you feel better about having done that because you believe in it than not. Okay, so in other words, when we understand that human nature says that everyone seeks happiness, I, I learned this from my great friend, the late Harry Brown. You know, everyone seeks, ultimately everyone seeks happiness. Okay, now, people, uh, happiness is defined by the mental feeling of well-being. Everyone seeks happiness. In all other ways, we're different, but everyone ultimately seeks happiness. Now, happiness is relative. We need to understand that what, what brings happiness to one person may not bring happiness to another person, might make someone miserable. So if we're in the sales process, we love a certain benefit or feature about our product or service. We love it. That doesn't mean that's what they would love. Our job is to discover what they would find to be of value. Okay, that's real world. That's not, it doesn't matter how much we love it. It's do they love this thing? And then the third part, you know, we, everyone seeks happiness. Happiness is relative. Uh, the third part is resources are limited. And that's not to say we, uh, we live in a lack world. We don't. We live in, a, in an abundant universe. But everyone as individuals has a, uh, a limited number of years, right? <laughs> a limited amount of time, right? A limited amount of finances, a limited amount of knowledge, a limited amount of energy. So people are always having to make choices. So every choice a person makes is always based on, do they believe it will, it will or will not bring them closer to happiness based on how they understand happiness and based on the limited choices they believe they have. Okay, that's human nature. The go-giver ties into human nature because the go-giver places the interest of the other person first. It says if you want to make the sale, if you want to have a great relationship, if you want to persuade someone to do a certain thing, you can't, you can't be as concerned about what you can't think that they're going to care as much about whether you want it. <laughs> You've got to tap into do they want, need, desire that? How does that, uh, uh, how does that align with their values? How does that align with their sense of happiness? Great. Now, are there any misconceptions about what being uh, a go-giver is? I mean, the name itself almost implies that you give constantly. Can you be taking advantage of that way? You know, for example, how does a go-giver tell people, no, I do not want to do that? Okay, so let's let's look at that on a, a couple of levels. First, yeah, there, there's certainly an, a... Um, uh, misconception, uh, especially if someone hasn't read the book yet, they hear a title like The Go-Giver and they think, well, you're giving yourself away or you're giving things away for free or you're putting yourself at everyone's beck. No, it has nothing to, to do with that. Being a go-giver simply means you understand that having a, an, a an intense focus on bringing value to others uh, is, uh, again, the, the, the most uh, uh, not only benevolent or pleasant, but the most financially profitable way and, and, and profitable in other ways that we would uh, look at life. So no, it has nothing to do with being taken advantage of. If you're being taken advantage of, it's not because you're being a go-giver, it's because you're doing things that allow yourself to be taken advantage of. 
So don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's go to your question. How do you say no to people? Because, again, well, doesn't a go-giver mean you're always saying yes to everything or else you're not a go-giver? Of course not. Uh, in fact, as a go-giver, you're probably very, very successful, including financially. And a lot of people are asking you to do a lot of things. And you have to say no. And you have to say no considerably more than you say yes. Um, and that's okay. But what a go-giver would do is they would say no in a way that respects and honors the other person. Uh, for example, I've heard people say, and let's use a very generic example. Somebody asks you to serve on a committee of some type, and you just don't want to. Okay. Now, there's advice out there that says no is a complete sentence. Right? You know, that's become politically correct lately. But really, is that realistic? Are you just going to say no? I mean, it's rude. It's impolite. <laughs> you're going to turn a friend into an enemy. Uh, you're not going to ever have a chance to work with that person again in the future because you're going to turn them right off to you, understandably. And you may want to do something with them in the future. OK, so I don't think saying it that way is a, a good way at all. Uh, I think that sounds better than it is. I can't think of anyone who'd actually do that. Uh, then so so we'll, we'll just you know, make up kind of like a little bit of a fib, you know, such as, well, I don't have time. Now, the challenge with that is, you know, you, you do have time. As human beings, we don't actually have time. We make time to do those things that we want to do. What it is, is that we value not doing it more than we value doing it. And, and again, that's that's okay. That's a personal decision that we, we need to make. The problem is when you say, I would, but I don't have time, this other person has is hearing that all the time from people that they're trying to recruit on this committee. So when they persuasively show you how time will not be an issue, now you're stuck. Now you either have to admit that you are fibbing, which is going to kind of make them mad, and you're not going to feel good about yourself, or in order to save face, you've got to uh, accept the thing you don't want to do, which again, I'm, that, that's not what I'd suggest. So here's a, here's a way to do it, a go-giver way, <laughs> that will set you free while making this other person feel genuinely good about themselves and about you and about the situation. Uh, and it would go like this again. They've asked you to serve on a committee and you just might say, mm, thank you so much for asking. While it's not something I'd like to do, please know how honored I am just to have been asked. That's it. Mm. You you haven't given an excuse. There's nothing for them to hang on to. There's nothing for them to overcome and answer. You let them know how honored you are. You thank them. But, but, you know. Unless this person is just absolutely the most unreasonable person, or they, they just can't be mad at you. You know, they have they feel good. In fact, I've had countless people tell me because this works on email as well as face to face or on the phone. How I have countless people thank me for the kind way that I told them no, uh, and I've taught many other people to do this, and they've written to me with the same kind of responses. Uh, now, by the way, so if this person, though, is going to kind of keep at it a little bit to try to, you know, kind of, well, come on, we really, uh, you just, you know, you just, you just listen, you don't interrupt, you have a, a pleasant look on your face, no emotion, no defensiveness, you wait till they finish, uh, and then you simply say, oh, I, I, again, I'd rather not, but thank you so much again. I love so, it. Kill, kill them with kindness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. <laughs> Um, so there's there's two quotes I have um, that really hit home personally uh, during this book, and I think you know as as we're on the topic of business, um, there's a quote about being anxious, and here it is. It says, "Of course he seems relaxed. He is relaxed. Whoever said being anxious gets more accomplished?" And and that right there, it's it, you're, you're bombarded by all these things, but it's it's all about being relaxed and and i remember that very vividly in the book <laughs> the the gentleman in the office he was very relaxed just dressed down and comfortable so right. what what does that look like you know for you and have you applied that same you know relaxed comfort in that business atmosphere uh it's something i have to continually work at you know, I mean, by by my nature, I'm not a relaxed person. By my nature, by my nature, I'm kind of hyper and you know, lots of you know. So, <laughs> and of course, I don't. <laughs> yeah, I'm passionate, and and it's not that I want to. Well, a person can even be they can be very calm and still be passionate, but I tend to be. Yeah, let's put it this way: I wouldn't be a good poker player. OK, you know, it's like I get Delta, you know, an ace. It's like, yeah, you know, so it's not. <laughs> but uh, that would be a tell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so. 
Um, so no, I mean, I, I think that's something I actually have to work on. Sometimes, you know, you put characters in there because you relate to them and other times because you'd like to be able to relate to them. <laughs> yeah, of course. So those characters in the book, did you happen to know any, or was it kind of just, you know, pulling from each personality that you, you've kind of met over the years? Uh, in this book, we, John and I both kind of pulled, uh, combinations of people. You know okay. that we knew so you know there were two or three types of things now there were a lot of incidents in the book that happened in real life and we just put them within the story but the characters aside from taking names of some people we knew uh were also you know maybe based on two or three people put together into one character great now i think this is an this is not one of my favorite quotes in the book um and it was on marriage advice and it said a generally sound business principle will apply anywhere in life in your relationships in your marriage anywhere and here's a go-giver relationship advice quote from the book it says i care more about my wife's happiness than i do about my own and in that you know not 50 50 it's 100 mm -hmm. percent that, that really hit home so that was, and, and I appreciate that. I'm glad you, you enjoyed that. That actually came from a conversation I had with my dad when I was about 10 years old. Um, some of my friend's parents were getting divorced, and a lot of them were, you know, fighting all the time and everything. And, um, and I remember saying to my dad, you know, how is it that you and mom have such a great marriage? And, you know, they just celebrated their 63rd anniversary, I think, 62nd or 63rd. Wow. A 60 second, I think. And um, and uh, I said that you and mom have such a great marriage when my friend and he said, you know, Bob, when you really, really love someone, you actually care more about their happiness than you do your own. Now, in the book, we actually had Joe add a line in there, something like it. And I don't remember exactly, but it was something like, well, wouldn't some people call that codependent or something like that? And we put that in there because we knew that in today's sort of society kind of needed to put that in. That wasn't the question I even asked my dad. Well, I wouldn't have known what codependent meant at 10 years old, but, <laughs> but also I knew what he meant. And that is, you know, two people who genuinely love and like each other, both try to please the other person and make the other, but you identify more with the other person's happiness than your own. And of course that person feels the same way. And when you've got that, now you've got rather than 50, 50, you've got 100, 100 or simply 100. And so, yeah, that came that came right out directly from a conversation. Uh, it's amazing. Sounds like you have a great relationship with your father. Um, Thank you. So, did you have a lot of the principles that you were, you know, it sounded at ten to remember just that little nugget, and and that's like if you forget anything else, you know, just give a hundred percent, and they, like you you can do no wrong. Um, so, did did his words and guidance come through the book in, in any other areas? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, John also came from a great marriage, too. His his parents, who are, are no longer with us, unfortunately, they also had a, a wonderful relationship. And so, you know, I think John and I were both able to draw from that, uh, you know, in the, the book. And, and John and his wife, Anna, just, you know, just the loveliest couple that you can imagine. So it's it's really a nice, uh, you know, it's really a nice thing. Great. How was it writing the book together? Well, you know, this is, it's really a pleasure with John because, and you know, we had only, had we met, yeah, we met in person once before we wrote the book. And now, really? yeah, yeah, he was my editor and he was the editor in chief of a magazine I used to write for. And so when I had the idea for the book, he was in a very specific niche. So very few people knew of his genius because he's a, an amazing writer. And now he's in demand all over the place. But back then, you know, uh, there was a certain niche that knew, and fortunately I knew. And so when I, when I came up with the basic idea for the story, John was the guy I wanted to be the lead writer and the storyteller. Uh, when, I, when I asked him about this, I, it was either over the phone or through an email, I can't remember. But he was still busy at the time. So he and his, he, back then she was his fiance, Anna, they were visiting her mom in Tampa and they drove four hours across the state and we had about a four hour dinner just discussing the book itself and then he uh, still had to think about it. about three weeks later he called me and said yeah I think we've we've got something here so that's how that kind of started um, but in writing it with him it was really a pleasure is you know there's no question who's the better writer you know so so while we <laughs> yeah. went back and forth on everything it was always you know the, the, there wasn't any question as far as what was gonna sound better you know <laughs> he's such a good writer yeah well that's great so so last but not least what's your definition of success I would say my definition of success itself is an ongoing 
feeling of joy, peace of mind, happiness, based on having done one's best to live up to their potential. I think when you do that, you are successful. That's a powerful definition. Thank you. Now, the the new book that you've come out with, so how does that build on The Go-Giver? Well, you know, influence was a part of the, the first book. There was the law of influence in, in law number three. And in our second book, The Go-Giver Leader, uh, it was about leadership and influence. Well, this one we decided to just kind of take it deep on influence and really make it about influence. But to also make sure that people understood that while influence on a very basic level can be defined as the ability to move a person or persons to a desired action, usually within the context of a specific goal, that's influence by its definition, that's not the substance of, of influence. It's not, the, it's not the essence of influence. The essence of influence is pull as opposed to push. Right? A great influencer doesn't try to push their will on others. They, they're not pushy, right? You don't you never hear people say, wow, that Dave, he is so influential. He has a lot of push with people. Right? <laughs> no, he has a lot of pull. She has a lot of pull with people because that's what influence is. It's an attraction. It's pull. Mm -hmm. uh, great influencers attract people first to themselves and then to their ideas. And they do this how? Well, we go back to the go-giver way. They ask themselves questions such as how does what I'm asking this person to do align with their goals, their wants, their needs, their desires, their values? And when we ask ourselves these questions thoughtfully and intelligently, genuinely, authentically, right? Not as a way to manipulate another person to doing our will, but as a way of building everyone in the process. Well, now we've come a lot closer to earning that person's commitment to our idea. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. I have to pick up a copy today, the whole book. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoy it. Yeah, no, I will. I mean, if it's anything like the go-giver, like I said, it instantly... Top 10 favorite book, oh, um, oh, just well-written, great advice, like you said, not just in business, but in life as well. You know, a great, you know, definition and, and key topic you can apply on almost anything in life. And I think that's what you, you really did with the go-giver way. So thank you for that. Oh, I appreciate that. Well, do you want to tell the listeners, Bob, where the, the best place to get a copy of your book and find out more about you? Sure. Best uh, place to go is the go giver without the hyphen, the go giver dot com. And while there, you can click on any of the books, the go giver, go giver leader, the go giver influencer, and it will take you to a page where you can get the first two chapters. And then if you read those and like where they're headed, just click through to uh, Amazon or wherever you'd like and you can pick up the whole book there. Great. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. We really appreciate uh, your teachings and your wisdom and, and uh -huh. putting it in a book so we can all find out. Thank you, Scott. I appreciate that so much. Thank you. And that ends our interview with author Bob Berg. Him and John David Mann wrote the book called The Go-Giver, which is a national bestseller. It is a little story about a powerful business idea. When I read it, I couldn't put it down. It is instantly in my top 10 favorite books of all time. I highly recommend it to anybody in business and in life looking to learn the principles to success. That's all we have for today. Make sure you check us out on Facebook at The Book Club Interview, and we'll see you next time.